very much. Good morning, the Achahili Gini Yushle, and my hon Hain, my talk to Dalla, the counter shop, the wedding for you in Fuelsia Gordon, our courtly and show August. The Sulagum go morning, go salt as an sharting and show August go garden as Joe to Hain August and for Invre at Hans Atlanti. Chairman, I'm glad to hear that I am now going to be in control. <laughs> we'll not tell the Taoiseach that one. <laughs> <laughs> the process of change and reform across our education system must be constant but well considered. The nature of the system is such that implementation of reform and the measurement of its impact can take considerable time. The impact of a change we make today may not be fully realised for many years. The prime example is in the area of curriculum and programme changes. Will a student emerge with an enhanced level of knowledge, understanding and skill to better realise the potential as a result of that change? One cannot be fully certain until later in their lives. The stakes, therefore, are high. Remember here that the most important people that any reform will impact on is our young. And the consequences of failed or bad reform can be detrimental to their educational attainment. Well-considered and successful change, on the other hand, can significantly enhance their future prospects and impact positively on society and our economy. I should be clear that I make these points at the outset not to caution or dampen the desire for ambitious reform and innovation in our education system. Rather, I make them to highlight the importance of investing in the time to get it right. As such time is often necessary, the momentum for change must remain constant. Establishment of bodies to maintain, the, maintain that day-to-day -day momentum, such as the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment, the Teaching Council and our proposed Qualification and Quality Assurance Ireland, is important in that regard. They ensure the necessary ongoing reform and development of curricular, teaching and quality standards. For reforms of a structural nature, each generation must look at the construct of our educational system afresh. This type of change is cyclical as our educational system evolves to adopt best international practice and meet the changing needs of Irish society over time, while retaining its quality and standing with the public, both at home and abroad. I do not intend to speak about the biggest of those structural reforms now pending, that is the higher education sector this afternoon, or I do intend. But before I do so, I want to make the point that regardless of what change we undertake at third level, the ability of any student to make the most of their higher education is determined by the education received and skills gained during his or her formative years in primary and post-primary. And within the school system, that is in turn determined by the quality of our teachers and the effectiveness of the curriculum. I deliberately place the quality of our teachers first on that list. Born at the end of the 19th century, Patrick McGill, the man whose memory we honour this week, each year, described his educational history as three years at a mountain school. It may seem counterintuitive that Atlantis boy, who then left school at the age of 12 and who worked as the navvy while publishing poetry and eventually the novels that has won him international renown, rose so high from such inauspicious beginnings. One could speculate that his teacher during those three years at the mountain school made a significant impact on the young man, leaving him with a hunger for learning. Irish parents know the importance and the impact that a good teacher can have on their children's progress throughout school. The role of the teacher is rightly highly regarded in Ireland as a result. And the consequence of this is that it attracts a very high standard of entrance. At primary level, entrants to our Bachelor of Education degrees are generally in the top quartile of their cohort. For second level, entry into the higher diploma is competitive and based on a student proving him or herself in their undergraduate degree. And we are fortunate among our OECD peers to have such a high calibre of entrance to teaching. The professionalisation of teaching 
In recent years, has also strengthened the resolve of teachers vis-à-vis -vis their own career and professional development. Continued professional development by teachers is a key dimension of ensuring quality of outcomes for the student population within our schools. External inspection and honest self-evaluation within schools and their communities is also important in helping teachers strive for and achieve better outcomes. Parents and pupils have a critical role in that evaluation and the changes that I introduced last month in the system of the whole school evaluation providing for the introduction of confidential parental and pupil questionnaires adds to the robustness of that process. However, an area where to date we have let our new teachers down and consequently where reform is required is in assisting with their transition from training and qualification to teaching in the classroom. There is significant evidence from different jurisdictions that putting in place an effective arrangement for the induction and probation of newly qualified teachers can make a significant contribution to the quality of the teacher profession. And with, and with any aspect of human behaviour, it is in a teacher's first months and year in the post that they will develop the techniques and habits that will stay with them for the duration of their careers. And it is a critical period for any young profession, including a teacher. In Ireland, our system of induction and probation to date has had significant weaknesses. Induction support for teachers at primary level is limited and has not involved the principal and the teaching profession sufficiently. With some small number of exceptions, induction support at post-primary level is virtually non-existent. Our probationary process for teachers is also well below the optimum. At primary level, it excludes any meaningful involvement of the employer, the management of the school. And at post-primary, it involves, in most cases, the sign-off of a principal teacher without any observation of the teacher's work within the classroom. The current system, therefore, is making a very limited contribution to teacher quality and reform is required. That reform will involve empowering the teaching council in relation to the induction and probation of teachers, which I can now confirm I intend to do with effect from September 2012. While work will continue between now and then and the exact detail of the policy framework to be put in place by the Teaching Council in that regard, it is clear to me that we need to ensure that teachers are required at a minimum to satisfactorily complete an approved induction programme as part of a new probationary process that has robust external and internal verification mechanisms. And as a precursor to this, a new induction support programme is to be made available to all primary teachers qualifying from September of this year and to all new post-primary teachers as soon as possible within the new school year. The programme will be delivered through a variety of modes in education centres or in other suitable locations and out of school time for approximately 20 hours over the course of the school year. It will provide professional support and further development suited to the professional learning needs of newly qualified teachers. I believe the reform is an important one that should assist teachers overcome challenges and problems they face in adjusting to the classroom dynamic. And if the quality of our teachers is at the foundation of our system, then the quality, content and relevance of our curriculum represents the building blocks. As I have heard from my co-speakers here this afternoon, the education we provide in our schools and colleges, together with the learning outcomes achieved, are crucial for the individual life opportunities of each student, for our economic development and for the quality of the society that we live in. And in that regard, ongoing review and reform of the curriculum to need, meet the needs of contemporary Ireland is absolutely critical. In my view, reform of the curriculum should result in a more active learning experience for the individual, promote a real understanding within learning and aim to embed a seed of creativity and innovation in the learner. In Ireland, curriculum reform must also move the student away from the trends towards rote learning. The traditional approach of teacher-led instruction and memorising of information must be replaced with a greater emphasis on critical thinking. Reform must ensure our students acquire the key skill set that enable them to be a flexible and independent learner throughout the whole of their lives. So from the first day in school, a child should be embarking on a journey that leads them to this objective. The delicate balance between content and knowledge and the skills and core capacity to learn 
must be maintained for a successful outcome. International research shows that these skills need to be integrated into subjects, not taught as an add-on. A programme of ongoing reform in primary and second level schools with this focus is now underway. And a good example of this in action is the review I recently launched of the Junior Certificate. The wider programme for change has been driven by the longitudinal research by the ESRI, by international research, by the outcome of evaluations in schools, and widespread consultation with our stakeholders, both within and outside the system. And revised services and the methods of assessment that move away from traditional rote in science, mathematics, and other subjects are coming on stream, and other programmes such as the Transition Year and the Young Social Innovators programme are designed to ensure that essential skills such as research, teamwork, planning, critical reflection, and active citizenship are developed. And while a broad range of subjects is vital to create well-rounded individuals, there are skills and capabilities that transcend all subject areas and are vital tools in the understanding of the world around us. Mathematics is one such skill, and it became apparent in recent years that the standard of teaching and the learning of mathematics in our schools was not nearly sufficient to allow our children to perform in a range of disciplines to the level required for the 21st century. Our industry leaders, who have articulated once again here this afternoon, and those considering investing in Ireland also highlighted the need for graduates with better mathematical skills. And in response, unprecedented investment in Project Maths is in the process of transforming the way maths is taught and learned in our schools. Our ongoing experience in Project Maths has told us the truth of Bernard Russell's assertion, and I quote that, more important than the curriculum is the question of the method of teaching and the spirit in which the teaching is given. Acknowledging this emphasises a wider truth. The educational system is not an arid landscape. It is populated and led by those who are themselves committed to the value of learning, who wish to transmit that value system to those who are under their tutelage. Project Maths will now mainstream in all of our secondary schools this September. It will bring about a changed approach to student learning of mathematics, with greater use of context and applications and greater emphasis on the development of problem-solving skills. It should con significantly contribute to enhancing interest in mathematics across our second level system. And the success of Project Maths and initiatives like this depend on an interaction between policymakers and innovative teachers who are informed by research, scholarship, and engagement with other stakeholders. Implementation requires access to the continuous professional development and support I've already highlighted. This just opposes the position of new ideas and committed people are necessary factors for successful innovation right across wider society and the economy. And Craig Barrett rightly asserted in recent months that at the heart of an innovative society are smart people, smart ideas and the right environment. Smart people and smart ideas should find a natural home in the education system. Nowhere in the education cycle is it truer than in our higher education institutes, where knowledge is created and transmitted, where creative and skilled graduates for the 21st century are formed. Our higher education institutions are the nexus of Ireland's future innovation society, and this places an enormous burden of responsibility on them. Recognising this, in government we have embarked on the process to consider and formulate a strategy for the development of higher education for the next 20 years. It is a strategy that will provide for the next stage of structural reform and development across our higher education sector. The strategy group under the chairmanship of Dr. Colin Hunt will be presented to me uh, over the coming weeks. The timing and the importance of this group's recommendations in helping to shape the future societal and economic development in Ireland is very significant. Our challenge is to leverage the considerable strengths of our higher education system and to build on the enormous strides that have been taking place over recent decades in positioning the system to respond effectively to the complex, fast-growing and changing demands of the future. When Patrick McGill was a child, the higher education landscape in Ireland was vastly different. Coulihan tells us that Ireland shared in the great contemporary debates on liberal versus utilitarian education, secular versus religious universities, 
research versus teaching. Arguing against vocationalism and utilitarianism was liberal education's most famous exponent, Cardin Newman, who regarded the purpose of education to train man as man rather than for individual professions. I cannot imagine that this world of academic debate played much of a role in McGill's life. With little opportunity to access intermediate or secondary education, the university system remained the preserve of the elite. In the early 20th century, 300 students attended UCD, with under 1,000 students in Trinity College. It was not until the 60s that groundbreaking reforms, such as the introduction of free secondary education for all, made more advanced education a viable opportunity for the masses. This would transform the scale of demand for higher education within a generation. We are seeing the culminative effect of the historical evolution of the Irish education system today. Two in three 18-year-olds apply to attend higher education courses, and Ireland's participation rate has climbed to over 60%. In the coming decades, we face a new challenge. We will need to facilitate a far more diverse cohort of learners that the challenges of the 21st century workplace will require people to enter and re-enter the education system throughout their lives and their careers. The great either-or debate to which Coulihan refers have modified, and there is now a recognition that to serve the needs of Ireland in the 21st century, institutional diversity is required. The Irish system already encompasses institutions with distinctive and diverse mission. Traditional universities have flourished, and the Institutes of Technology, founded against a backdrop of rapid industrial development, have provided an essential response in providing innovative routes for transfer and progression, attracting an ever-growing cohort of our school leavers and non-traditional learners into higher education. When we look at the international landscape of higher education, we can see that the 21st century institutional missions can be viewed through a complex and multifaceted lens. We can identify points of differentiation when looking at teaching and learning profiles, student profiles, the orientation and range of qualifications, the nature of research activity, and the nature and extent of regional and international engagement. Future policy for higher education in Ireland should be directed at supporting diverse institutions of sufficient scale, capacity, and reputation across a spectrum of innovation strengths and meeting a range of opportunities and needs. We need to harness and support the natural inclination of our institutions to develop their own capabilities and reputations within a robust systems framework. Institutional autonomy enables innovation, flexibility and responsiveness at the level of individual institutions in reacting to new opportunity and in meeting the needs of individuals, communities and enterprises. Autonomy will continue to be an essential feature of the Irish system. It is equally essential, however, that this is balanced by transparency and accountability for performance against stated national policy objectives. Such is required to reflect both the funding contribution of the state and the wider public good responsibilities of higher educational institutes to society. Autonomous institutions and the state must therefore agree objectives and develop pathways that will ensure overall performance delivery across the system that is coherent, measurable, transparent and aligned to national needs. What we want to achieve is an Irish higher education system of strong, consolidated, collaborating institutions, fulfilling diverse roles that collectively respond to the needs of individuals, enterprise and society. To achieve this, it is clear to me at this point that consolidation is required for, for critical mass, institutional mission diversity must be protected and enhanced, and effective collaboration in meeting the full range of societal demands, both within regions and nationally, must be prioritised. To this end, diverse institutions within a region, building on current strength and roles, must form clusters focusing on providing clear routes for transfer and progression. This will ensure that the entire range of higher education provision, from NQF level 6 to 10, of the appropriate quality and critical mass is accessible to all potential learners within that region. These will be an important guiding parameters for the evolution of future institutional roles and relationships in higher education and will drive significant reform over the coming years. 
These questions around future institutional mission and the challenges of balancing autonomy to carry out a unique function with the need for accountability to the society served form just part of a contemporary debate. Others relate uh, to how best institutions should be governed and managed, how best they can relate and respond to the communities they serve, the purpose and nature of research, and critically in these times, the tension between quality and quantity in terms of meeting the cost of mass higher education against a backdrop of huge projected growth and demand. The challenge of our forthcoming higher education strategy will to be mapping a way to resolve these core challenges and tensions. If we look at the higher education system as a central engine of creativity and innovation, it is clear that our capacity to resolve these and other major challenges will rely largely on our ability and willingness to draw on the best of smart ideas and smart people from within the higher education system itself. Good ideas are often sparked by the meeting of different perspectives within a community and may be born of complexities and contradictions. Dr. Faust, in her recent address to the Royal Irish Academy, acknowledged the benefits of a diverse research landscape and noted that from the beginning, universities have drawn power from the creative tensions between the search for applied knowledge and the devotion of knowledge pursued for its own sake for the simple satisfaction of curiosity. Our, policy, our future policy in research should have it as its cornerstone, the principle that Ireland will require the full spectrum of research activity from basic to applied research within and across disciplines, within institutions, between collaborating institutions and between institutions and industry, across fertilisation of ideas and perspectives is likely to serve Ireland well. In seeking to restore Ireland's economic health, decision makers and policy makers must acknowledge the broader impacts of a high quality research system on Ireland's, on Ireland's cultural and social well-being. We need to balance the management of the major investments of public money, monies going into research and development with recognition that some research impacts cannot be assessed against short-term goals too soon. As Jerome Weisner, former president of MIT and science advisor to President Kennedy, was fond of saying, that's like planting a seedling and a short while later yanking it out to see if the roots are healthy. Our institutions must also accept, however, that there are accountabilities for the performance to society and must continue to develop an open interface with those in the wider community. Our institutions must also understand that there has to be an eventual purpose and a destination for the ideas generated through research activity. Technology transfer and innovative solutions for industry and enterprise will have obvious benefits for Ireland's economic welfare and future job creation. Coming to the education portfolio as I have had from the enterprise portfolio, this is something about which I am acutely aware. With such significant public funding now directed at it, research cannot solely be for research's sake. Similarly, public policy and debate about ethical and moral issues benefit from the independent thinking and clarity of analysis of academic communities engaged in interpreting the world around us. Indeed, we need to be better to ensure that public debate in Ireland benefits from the wealth of knowledge and understanding within the walls of our institutions. New knowledge and ideas have an equally important destination within those walls, and that is to guide the learning and concepts transmitted to the students seeking to attain their undergraduate or postgraduate degrees. Our students' education at third level should be guided by teachers whose expertise in their chosen discipline is continually updated through research, through scholarship, or in more vocationally orientated disciplines through up-to-date practice. This ensures that curricula are of the continuing relevance. Discovery and learning, inquiry and instruction are intimately interlinked. As with our teachers at primary and post-primary, it is of critical importance that all academic staff members have expertise and access to the latest research in the educational methods and the pedagogical techniques. We need to ensure that teaching methods at third level are designed to promote creativity, innovation and adaptability in our graduates. The essential skills will then disperse through wider society, which graduately, where graduates will take their place as leaders, as employees, as parents and citizens. The process of reform across our higher education system will begin afresh with the publication and implementation of our new higher education strategy 
to which considerable time and energy has been devoted over the past year. It, along with reforms, we have set in motion at primary and post-primary level for teaching and in the curriculum, and in a number of other areas that I have not had time to address this afternoon, will ensure a legacy of reform during my tenure in Marlborough Street. I very much hope that despite this time of particular economic difficulty, they will, they will leave our education system stronger and better equipped to serve this and the future generations of our public. Thank you.